to start here is just two foundations for living at a God-honoring pace. And really these two points are really the whole message. We're just going to spend time unpacking these two things. Um, but here's what scripture teaches us is an alternative to the empty pursuits that we so often fall into. The first is that we live with Jesus. I'm with him. I walk with him. I spend time with him. I'm enjoying his presence. I know that he is with me. And so I choose to be with him. We're spending time with him. I live with Jesus. And then the second is that I live for Jesus. He is my pursuit. He is who I am chasing after. He gives me purpose. I'm living with and for Jesus. And our main passage for today gives us some really great principles for living out those two foundations. Uh, the book of Philippians was really on my mind as I was thinking about pace. I love some of the parts of Philippians where Paul talks about striving after the Lord, that the Lord is his pursuit, that he's cast off everything else so that he can chase after Jesus. And this passage really came to my heart as I was thinking about how we can help have a God honoring pace in our lives. So I'm going to read it. You can read along in your notes, follow along with me. This is Philippians four, four through nine. It says, rejoice in the Lord. Always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me uh, or seen from me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Um, such an incredible passage and so much here. And so we're just going to take some time to um, unpack this. And the first part, like I said, before we can really live for Jesus, we have to live with Jesus. So we're going to start there and look at what Philippians 4 has to teach us about living with Jesus. Being with him, walking with him, having close personal relationship with him, it really sets us up for living a God-honoring pace. We really cannot just rush through life and not enjoy it and not enjoy him when we're walking with him. I um, mean, he helps us, he cures us from pursuing all of the other empty things. And um, so what we're going to do as we talk about living with Jesus is we're going to look at three rhythms, three life rhythms of how we can live with Jesus. And we're going to start here. This is kind of the building block where we'll go from here is we're going to look at our daily rhythm. Our daily rhythm has to include both set aside and ongoing time with Jesus. It requires both of those things every day if we're going to live at a God-honoring pace. And another thought about that that's in your notes is that being with Jesus replaces anxiety with joy and with peace. So when we're not honoring God, our lives are characterized by anxiety. We're frantic, we're rushing around, we, we can't even keep up with our own selves. But when we walk with Jesus, he gives us joy and peace. And we see that in Philippians 4, which we're about to look at a few more of the verses. And uh, we're going to spend, kind of camp out on this point for just a few minutes. Because if we don't have our daily rhythm right, our weekly and then our lifelong pattern isn't going to be right either. But if we can get this daily pattern right and then move forward into how we're walking in our weeks and our months um, and through our life, uh, the Lord can really help us live at a God-honoring pace. So um, let's look then back at Philippians 4. I'm going to highlight verses 4 and then also 6 and 7. Don't worry, not forgetting about 5. We will come back to verse 5 because I love verse 5. Okay, but here's what verse 4 says. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. And then verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this passage so shows us a few things that will begin to characterize our lives as we spend time all throughout the day with Jesus. And the first characteristic is joy. We're in Jesus. We're walking with him. He, we, know, we recognize that our lives are hidden in him. And so we rejoice. And I love that Paul, the writer of Philippians, he doesn't just say it once, but he says it twice. He says rejoice. And then he says, and I'll say it again. And he even says it with an exclamation mark with 
which I love. He says, rejoice. Um, I love exclamation marks. I think they're the best. And so when people in the Bible use them, I'm like, they're excited. Let's go. Um, So we rejoice. We're filled with joy because of the Lord. And it's so difficult to be stressed out when you're filled with joy. Um, And I love as well that the verse encourages us to when are we supposed to rejoice in the Lord? Always. So it's again, it's this ongoing relationship with Jesus all throughout the day. So the first characteristic is joy. The second is peace. I love that this verse says that we can choose not to be anxious about anything, right? And that then when we do that, and as we are bringing the Lord all of our requests, as we're coming to him in prayer throughout the day, that the peace of God that goes beyond anything that we can understand, that that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. When we're living at a pace that's not honoring to God, it steals our peace. It robs that from us, and the Lord wants to restore that to us. And so we're characterized by joy, we're characterized by peace, and then we're also characterized by being thankful, that we're a thankful people. I love that as it says that we're continually going before the Lord with prayer and petition, that it says that we do it with thanksgiving, that we are a thankful people. When we're pursuing empty things, we're focused on the things that we don't have. But within our hearts, when we choose that our attitude is going to be thankful, we're focused on the goodness of the things that the Lord has already blessed us with. So those things begin to characterize our life, joy, peace, and thankfulness. And I have a little challenge for us, something that I think would be really cool if the family of Celebration Church started doing this. Because, you know, when you're here on a Sunday morning, there are Who knows how many people that are going to come up to you and they're going to say, hey, how are you doing today, right? And like the standard response as you're like walking past them is to say like, good, right? Like that's kind of like standard response. How are you? I am good. Um, But every once in a while, like maybe people have a different response. Like if people walk by me and I'm like have all four of my kids with me, they're like, how are you? I'm like, we are rocking and rolling. We are rolling around. We are rolling through life. I say that a lot. Um, But I have a challenge for us and I've, I've... want to say this, how many of us, and I'm guilty, I'm going to raise my hand, if anyone's ever asked you, how are you, and you just respond back with busy? Anybody? Yeah, me. I've, I've definitely been there, and I've done that, and sometimes it's like a busy, like, man, like, yeah, we've just been going, and you maybe even kind of say it with a little bit of, like, just, like, excitedness of, like, yeah, we just have a lot going on, and we're definitely busy, or maybe you say it Hey, we are busy, and you're saying it like, I am exhausted, like, I know I'm doing too much. We are so slammed, we are so busy. But I have a challenge for us that we would respond with one of these three characteristics instead of busy. That when people say, how are you today? And if the word busy pops into our minds, that instead we would say, you know, I'm just really joyful. I'm feeling really joyful today. I'm rejoicing in God today. Or, hey, how are you today? And for us to be able to say, I have a lot of peace I'm feeling peaceful today. I'm really thankful for that. Or probably my favorite one is if someone said like, hey, how are you today? I'm really thankful. I feel thankful today. Because maybe we are busy and it's okay to be honest about that. Maybe you could even say, hey, I have so much going on, but I'm feeling so thankful. The Lord's really sustaining me through everything I have going on and I'm just thankful today. So there's just a little challenge. I don't know if anybody wants to do that, but uh, even just if you hear... Find yourself saying it, that you're busy. Take it as an opportunity to reevaluate. Um, because whenever we have this opportunity for all the responsibilities that we have, yes, but when we choose to do it with Jesus, it changes our attitude towards it and it changes everything. I mentioned to you guys that we were going to be on this point for a moment. And I just want us to look back at the way that that main point is worded about our daily rhythm is that our daily rhythm requires of us that we have set aside time with Jesus, but that it also requires ongoing time with Jesus. And really this passage in Philippians, it's talking about ongoing time with Jesus. And so God honoring pace does look like having, if you call it a quiet time, or if you call it your devotion time or whatever, that is so important. It's one of the um, things we're going to talk about in a little bit when we talk about priorities. But we, we do that, yes, but I don't know if any of you relate to this, but I can have a quiet time, I can spend time alone with the Lord, and then I can leave that quiet time and I can jump right into a frantic pace where I'm not still communing with God, where I'm not still focusing on Him, I'm not still living with Him and for Him. And so also when we have that set aside time, it should include prayer and it should include studying the word that's so important but for us also to use part of that time to just be with jesus to just sit 
to just rest in his presence. And something that the Lord has really encouraged me with and, and challenged me, honestly, is, and it's something that requires slowing down and being willing to pause, is he's encouraged me to just come to him when I'm spending time with him, or even maybe if I'm in the middle of my day, but to not be satisfied with just kind of pausing, but to slow all the way down and to come all the way into his presence. You know that feeling that you get when you're in corporate worship and you can feel the presence of God and you can feel the love of God? We can have that experience wherever we are. And God longs for us to have that. He longs for that kind of nearness to us. And he's always there. He's always near. He's always right there longing for us to come into his presence. And so I have found that if I do that first thing in the morning, if I, I pause, I stop, put the phone aside, put the kids in the other room or whatever it is I need to do, or maybe even do it while the kids are all right there around me and just close my eyes and just shut it all out. If I will pause and rest and wait until I just feel the love of the Lord and I receive that from him, then I can step into a healthy pace. So the faster I do that, then the, the, the faster I'm like, yes, I need that Lord. And then I'm willing to slow down and sit with him. Then it sets me up for success the rest of the day. But I haven't had a day yet where I've only had to do it one time. All through the day, the Lord encourages me and reminds me when I get off track, when I'm not being at a healthy pace again, he calls me back to that place again where I just, I've even done it in public and I'm sure I look crazy, but it's fine. Where I just close my eyes and I sit there and I wait. I wait as long as it takes for my heart to catch up with what the Lord's doing. And I'm sure, again, I look goofy because I close my eyes. And then I always like, when I'm done, I'm like smiling. And so I'm, again, I'm sure I look goofy. But we, for us to learn that from the Lord, because he longs for us to, like this verse says, to continually come before him in prayer all throughout our day. Um, so our daily pace then is about living out of who we are in Christ no matter what our responsibilities are for the day. It's about recentering ourselves around being with him, no matter, again, what, what our day holds. Um, which brings us to another way that we live with Jesus, and it's through our weekly rhythm. Our weekly rhythm centers on worship and rest. Weekly times of worship and rest, they replace loneliness with belonging. Because I think so often when we are not living at a healthy pace, we find ourselves feeling empty and lonely. And that is not what the Lord has for us. He wants us to feel a sense of belonging. Um, two verses that talk about the importance of having a, a rhythm of worship and of rest. One is Hebrews um, 10.25. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So again, just like Pastor encouraged us last week, the day of the Lord is near. Jesus is coming. He's coming back for us. And so how do we live with that in mind? We live together. We encourage one another. We don't give up meeting together. I know that there are days where it could be easier to stay at home on a Sunday morning and to say, I'll watch it online later. Or there are days that it's so hard to get to small group and it would be so easy, or so easy just to do something else or to stay at home instead. But for us to be committed to those things, committed to being with one another. And then the other verse here under this point is Exodus 28, which is one of the Ten Commandments. It says to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Which is Sabbath is just a day of every week that's set aside that looks different than your regular pace. That you're committed to refreshing yourself and realigning your heart with the Lord through that day. It doesn't mean you have to do nothing that day, but it means that, hey, this day is for me recentering. This day is for me refocusing on the Lord and putting aside some of the things that maybe I on another day I might would have thought were important, but for today I'm setting those things aside and I'm focusing on the Lord. Um so as we talk about connectedness and loneliness and belonging, I think it's important to point out that one of the big traps of these empty pursuits that we can fall into in our lives is believing the lie that more technology makes us more connected. Yeah. And it's a great tool. So often it's a great tool. Like I think about my kids are able to FaceTime their grandparents while they're gone, right? Like, and they can see each other even though they're across, you know, in, in totally different places. But so often we miss out on the opportunities for real relationships right all around us because we're trying to keep up with social media or trying to keep up with entertainment. 
I mean, in context to this point of living with Jesus, we don't only miss out on relationships with one another, but we miss out on relationship with the Lord as well. And I know when I get caught in that cycle, I think about, you know, the the endless scroll or, um, you know, the worst invention of all time is the thing that makes the next episode just automatically play. Like, I don't know who made that, but we need to go find him and like hold him accountable for what he has done to us because hours of our lives, people. Um, but when I get caught in that cycle and we think like what, what, the, what the entertainment or the technology or whatever, what it tells us is, hey, you're going to leave feeling like this is a break. Like you're, you're going to feel rested from this and you'll, this will be great, right? But for me, when I get stuck in that cycle, when I'm done, I don't feel rested. I probably stayed up later than I should have, for one. And I'm tired, and a lot of times I feel kind of lonely because I'm like, man, that all looks so great. But like, Or it's concerning if you're reading the news and you're like, oh, this is not good. And so you're left with all these negative feelings, and it, it didn't really refresh you at all. And so really, these things that we try to do to refresh us, they're really just more sowing the wind. But when we're committed to right relationships, that, hey, I'm going to be committed to being connected to my church family, to living in Christian community, and when we're committed to, again, setting weekly time aside to refresh ourselves, truly refresh ourselves, not just entertain ourselves, but doing things that we know better us, that know get us back on track with the Lord every single week, then we have a sense of belonging in Christ, and we have a sense of belonging in our church family. I mean, so our weekly pace is about that. It's about having set aside time to pause, to rest, to worship, and to get back on track with our mindset of living for Jesus. And so those two things, our daily and our weekly rhythm, they really produce then for us what becomes then our our life rhythm. Our life rhythm then, as what it says in Philippians, is that our life rhythm should be one that is noticeably different to others. We should stand out. And this is such a beautiful thought and such a beautiful verse. Um, And a point that I made there in the notes is that life lived with and for Jesus replaces striving for success. It replaces that with an anointing that points other people to Jesus. So let's talk about this life rhythm, what it says in Philippians 4, 5. Um, It says, let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. And I would say that if anything could be described as the opposite of this just like frantic pursuit of empty things, that gentle would be a really good word. You know, Jesus describes himself as gentle and lowly, as humble in heart. And other translations of this word gentle, they, they maybe say reasonableness. I think that's the King James. I'm pretty sure that's what I memorized as a kid. It speaks of being well-suited. It's like it's a good fit. In one of the verses in the New Testament that uses this word, it's talking about a master who's a good and kind master of his servants, that he's fair. And so when we think about this with, as, and as it relates to our pace with our lives, we don't, it's, this doesn't you know, describe something that's extreme and hurried and frantic. It describes someone that's, they're well-suited for where they are right now. They're equipped and they're prepared and they're taking it in stride. They're patient and they're looking out for the other people around them. And I think it's so interesting that it says that our gentleness is what would make us stand out. That that's what would be evident to all. I think that we definitely live in a world where a life like that, a gentle, humble, lowly, not self-seeking life, it really does stand out. Because we live in a pace where people are, where we have this temptation to just pursue what would make us happy or to pursue what makes, what is what we want, right? And it also, this verse reminds us of why this has to be our pace. Because the, again, we keep bringing it back up, the Lord is near. The day, our time is short. And so he's coming back and I don't have any time to be rough or to be frantic or to be unreasonable, which anxiety always makes us unreasonable, right? When we're like stressed out and then it's like this tiny thing becomes the huge thing and you know it doesn't make sense, but you can't get over it. Um, But everyone can see in our lives if we're living gently and it stands out from this consumeristic, empty pursuit pace that's around us. Um, people see this difference about us, and ultimately it draws them to Christ. And 
I think it's really important before we move on from this point to just say again, I mentioned that Jesus is gentle and he's humble of heart. And this aspect of Jesus's life was what gave him room to have so much compassion for people, even though he was an incredibly busy person. He lived the most impactful life of any person on all of earth, made the biggest impact, did the most, succeeded the most, and and being who God had called him to be, and yet he never missed the one person. When when we think about Jesus' busyness, there's a verse that says that um, there was a time that the coming and going of Jesus' ministry was so busy that they didn't even have time to eat. Um, sometimes my kids don't let me eat or you know you might say I'm at work and I can't eat I don't have time to eat right like Jesus relates to that level of activity and level of productivity hopefully productivity in our lives but he also even in the midst of that in that season actually is when he then was trying to get away to have time alone with his disciples but the 5,000 met him there and he ministered to them and he fed them he saw them he had compassion on them I think about the fact that when Lazarus, Jesus' good friend, was so sick, he didn't rush over to Lazarus, but he stayed where he was. He knew where he was supposed to be. He was well-suited for where he was supposed to be. I think about the time that Jesus spent with the woman at the well, that he saw her, he had compassion on her, and he took time out for just one person. Or about the fact that Jesus had already been called to go and heal someone else, and he was on his way to go and do that. But when a woman reached out and touched his robe, that he stopped everything and took time to have a life-changing moment with that one woman. And so, yes, that's awesome that that's how Jesus is, but it's how we are called to be as well, not to overlook people, not to, again, be so caught up in our own frantic pace that we're missing the people who are all around us. And I think this is a, a good moment, too, for those of us who are parents, especially parents of young children, our kids affect our pace, and we have to be willing to not leave our kids behind with the life pace that we're living, but to be gentle towards our children, to be well-suited as parents. And it's something that requires a lot of intentionality and that requires us reevaluating and making sure that we're doing that the way the Lord wants us to. But so Jesus' life was characterized by gentle grace, not by rush striving, and he made the greatest impact of all time with his life. Um, So we've talked then about how we can live with Jesus and the the rhythms of our life. Um, Let's look at some ways then that we can practically live for Jesus. And these things, I believe, will just really help us keep our life rhythm on track. Um, We can tell what we're pursuing when we evaluate what we're living for, right? what what we're what's driving us that's what we're pursuing and again we don't want our pursuit to be empty things we want our pursuit to be jesus so the first way one way that we can practically live for jesus um, is just by making sure our priorities are in order so important what are we prioritizing what are we putting in first place and i think this requires constant reevaluation. Um, I love Matthew 6, 33. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Those are the words of Jesus, and he's telling us, hey, your pursuit has to be the kingdom of God first. And when you choose to put me first, to put my kingdom first, everything else falls into place. And I've seen that in my own life. I've seen the positive of it, and I've seen when I haven't done it as well, the consequences of it. But so I wanted to talk about priorities because I think so often we get totally stressed, totally frantic about things that are not necessary. They are not priorities. They are things that we could literally just choose to cut out of our lives if we wanted to and nothing bad would happen. But it's like we don't believe that we could really do that or we, because of cultural norms, we feel like, no, this thing really should be a priority and I should... I have to keep this in my life when it's not putting food on the table or keeping a roof over our head or it's not a biblical priority. It's just something that, again, we've prioritized in our lives. And so I didn't realize how much this was going to feel like stepping on toes until I said it in the last service. But here's a few things, okay? Things that we might prioritize that we don't have to, that if it's what's stressing us out and if it's what's keeping us at an unhealthy pace, we can just choose to kick it to the curb. Our kids don't have to play sports. And we don't have to watch sports. 
we can, it's not bad. The kids can, it's not bad. But we, like, no one will die if we stop. It will be okay. We don't have to have social media. We don't have to have entertainment. Ah. And really, we just, we don't have to be everywhere and do everything and have the more, bigger, greatest all the time. I think if anything shows just how unhealthy we are about all of this as a culture, it's like watch commercials and like really watch them. I love commercials. I think they're hilarious. I have a great time. I watch TV for commercials. No, not really. But um, think about like a commercial for food. Like it's literally just a sandwich, okay? Not a big deal. Like you could go make one in your kitchen, but they're making it look like it's the most beautiful, like this sandwich will make your life better is what the commercial is saying. And the bacon looks like so juicy and like, ah, oh, the sandwich. It's ridiculous. Or think about like a commercial for a vacation, like this beautiful beach, you know, the sky is perfectly blue and the family's like frolicking around on the beach. And like, you see that and you're like, yeah, like that looks awesome. But then you think about it and you're like, I've been on vacation and like it rains sometimes and like the beach is really hot so like those people in real life would probably be sweating and like I do not look like those people look in their swimsuits like okay like it's just fake like it's just this it's of empty pursuit and our culture is just selling it to us as that it's what can really satisfy but can we just start to call it what it is and say like when we get a little pulled in, whether it's on like social media or if it's on commercials on TV or whatever it is, can we just start to call it out and just kind of like laugh at it? Like, hey, yeah, like I'm sure that would be fun or like, yeah, I'm sure that sandwich tastes good, but I'm living for Jesus. Like this is so much more important and Jesus is who really satisfies and so as we're talking about priorities, I think for a lot of us, it's, it's obvious and it's just that we need to get it back on track, but obviously the Lord should come first. Um, and then for those of us who are married, our spouse comes next. And for those of us who have kids, that then it's our kids. I mean, I did just feel like saying that for those of you who are single in this room today, the Lord has so much for you in the season of your life, that you get to put him first and pursue him with so much focus and don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on what he has for you in this season. So we pursue the Lord, we, we focus on him, we focus on our family and then it's our work. What has the Lord called us to do in this season? What are we doing that's productive? What are we doing that's providing for ourselves and providing for our family? And then it's ministering and serving to others. Am I prioritizing that? Am I prioritizing again like Jesus, seeing people for who they are and where they are? And so we need to make sure our priorities are in order and then another way that we live for Jesus is by ensuring that our thoughts are godly so much of this battle happens right in our mind and Philippians 4 has a lot to say about it it says it gives us really just a checklist of what we should be allowing in our mind and what we shouldn't it says whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things and I know for my own self, so often my pace gets messed up just right here between my two ears, in my own thoughts, in my own head. I'm really bad about the mental checklist of like, yes, I am here right now in this meeting or this whatever, and I'm sitting here, but I'm already thinking about what I need to be doing next. And then like before I know it, then I'm thinking about like things I didn't do, and then like what's going to happen if we don't do this and we don't do this, right? And it becomes this frantic mental pace and so if we go though through this verse and if we choose hey i'm going to guard my mind and if it doesn't line up i'm going to kick it out so the very first thing is if it's true so if i'm feeling this lie of that like hey mariah it all relies on you so like i hope you get everything done today because it's all up to you that's ridiculous i'm like no that's a lie like get that out or if it's a lie of comparison and jealousy when this verse it says that hey we should be thinking about things that are noble and right so I kick those things out. I'm like, no, I don't have room for those thoughts. And then the rest, it says pure, lovely, admirable. I think so often our thoughts, we can get bogged down with there's just crude thoughts, things that aren't pleasing and honoring to God. Because again, as we're feeding on so much technology and entertainment, we can't lie to ourselves and say that those things aren't impacting us and affecting us, they are. 
And a really amazing thing about Philippians 4 is it says that as we're pursuing the Lord, that he guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. But guess what? He will not force you to keep certain things out of your mind. We have to choose to partner with him. And I have to choose to say, Lord, thank you for giving me peace. Thank you for guarding my mind. I'm going to partner with you and I'm going to guard it as well. I'm not going to compromise the peace that you've given me by filling my mind with all of these other things. So we live for Jesus by thinking about good things. And then a final way, just a practical way that we can live for Jesus um, is by having practices that are biblical. Biblical practices. One of our Summer at Celebration, two of them, actually two of the messages were already about forming great spiritual disciplines, about how do you develop that in your life. Um, But it requires practice that's laid out for us in Philippians 4. It says, whatever you've learned, received, heard, seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So living for Jesus means disciplining ourselves and putting into practice the things that we see in his life. He became a person. He took on flesh. He was like us, and he lived the perfect life. And we have his life laid out for for us in his word. And so we can look to him and say, Jesus, how would you have handled this if you had been me? Come to the earth, Lord, in in this generation. Lord, how would you have walked through this? How would you have handled this? Because this is in your notes that living for Jesus means living like Jesus. That Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to do things the way that you would have done them. And that means practicing the kinds of things that Jesus practiced. And here's some some of those practices, some biblical practices that we see in Jesus' life. Jesus was committed to solitude. He was committed to going away and spending time alone with the Lord. Again, like we said earlier, of just shutting everything else out and just being with God. Jesus practiced prayer. He was committed to the word of God. We, we have to do that, have that practice of studying God's word, the practice of Sabbath, like we already talked about earlier, the practice of biblical community, of serving, of generosity, of compassion, these things that characterize Jesus's life. They don't just happen automatically. They require practice, and Jesus is our perfect example. He's the perfect example of a God-honoring pace. And the good news is that he's given us his spirit to empower us. We're not alone. So often, Pastor and Angela said when they were talking about the spiritual disciplines messages, part of their main point was that I work and then God works, right? That I come in with the disciplines and I I build the framework and then the Lord, he's the, the one who changes me. He's the one who makes an impact in my life as I walk out these disciplines. So is this easy? No. It requires being intentional. It requires ongoing reevaluation. But is it worth it? Yes. Yes, this life is so worth it. And I think we hear God's word on topics like this, and and we know that it's right, right? Like, Lord, I know. I know that these things are right. It's right to live with you. It's right to live for you. And God, I want that. I mean, maybe even many of us have a specific area where we know we could grow, something that the Lord maybe is calling us to give up or to do more of. But implementation can be really, really hard. And all of us this week, or even today, when we leave today, when we go throughout our week, when we go throughout the rest of our lives, we're all going to be battling this out. And so I really felt from the Holy Spirit to leave us with this charge or reminder, really just an example from Scripture of why we have to be willing to make the difficult choice, why it's so important, and why it's worth it. Um, And it's a story that maybe some of us are familiar from. It's from Matthew 19. It's a story about an interaction that Jesus had with a man. Um, It says that a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? They have a little bit more exchange, but then this is where they land. Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, then go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So we're all like this man. We selected this topic today. We said, God, how can I live a life that honors you? And ultimately we're seeking, just like this man, we're seeking eternal life, right? But not just, Lord, how do I get into heaven? But Lord, how do I live a life that honors you right now? My eternal life starts now. And how do I live a life that's pleasing to you? And 
I believe again, I said it a second ago, that many of us, or maybe all of us, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, he's placed something on our heart that he's saying, hey, that probably needs to go. Or hey, that needs to be monitored in your life. That needs to be regulated in your life. Or this needs to be added to your life. I believe that Jesus is saying, hey, if you would be perfect, if you would come all the way into my presence, come all the way into following me, he would say that there's a greater way that we could live with him and for him. And for that man, Jesus was saying to him, like, hey, you're pursuing your wealth, and I'm calling you to pursue me instead. And for that man, he felt like it was too great of a sacrifice. Because he had so much, he thought, how could Jesus ask me to give up something that's that important, that so defines me, that's so important to me, and for him, he decided, he went away sad, and he decided that he couldn't make that choice to follow Jesus. He believed that what he was pursuing was better than pursuing Jesus. And none of us would say that, but when we're choosing these other things that are empty, it's really what we're doing. We're pursuing someone else, something else other than Jesus. And I just wanna encourage us today to not think that the cost is too great, to not leave this place and to go through our week sad like this man. Because what might feel like an impossible sacrifice, that's what it felt like to that man. He said, this is impossible. I could never give that up, I could never sacrifice. And if there's something in our lives that feels that way, I could never lay that down, I could never cut that out of my life. What if that though is the key to living a God-honoring pace, if it's the thing that's holding us back, and if it's the thing that's keeping us from stepping into eternal life that begins right now. Don't hold on to something that you know is an empty pursuit. Don't leave this place sad like that man. Make the difficult but obvious choice to give up whatever it is that Jesus would call you to give up, to follow him. Anything he could ever say, hey, this is standing in your way, and that we would say, yes, Lord, you can have it. It's always worth it. There's nothing that's too great. The empty things we're pursuing are not fulfilling us. We see it in our lives. We feel the turmoil of reaping the whirlwind. So will we trust our Savior and fully commit to life his way. I want us to corporately respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in us right now. So can we all just take a moment to close our eyes? We're just gonna still our hearts before the Lord. This might feel really awkward or odd for you, but I would encourage you just press through those feelings. And if you don't get to a place where this moment is impactful for you right now, just try again. Come back to the Lord when you get in your car, come back to him when you get home today, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, let's practice what I was explaining to you guys earlier of pausing long enough to come all the way into the presence of God. We're all closing everything out and just come to him. Just be with him. Receive his love. Enjoy his goodness. Let him fill you up with his joy and with his peace. If you can tell you're not quite there, don't stop short. Be willing to wait. This God that we're coming before, he's the one who says, be still and know that I'm God. He's the one who says, come to me when you're weary and I'll give you rest. He's saying to us, I've chosen you. You are mine. And I know today he's speaking to our hearts. He's saying, child, I'm with you. I'm for you. So will you live with me? And will you live for me? Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this moment. We thank you that you're willing to be with us, God. What a gift. Help us, God, to learn from you, to learn to live at the pace that's honoring to you and to be quick to realign, to be quick to come back into your presence and to stop long enough 
where we really and truly see you for who you are. What a gift you've given us, Jesus. Help us, Lord, not to leave sorrowful, not to leave sad, not to stop short, but to surrender everything to you and in return to receive everything that you have for us, God. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray.